Welcome uh, to the last in the spring series of Community Medical School. Um, my name is uh, David Schneider. I'm a cardiologist over at the Medical Center. Um, and uh, another role that I uh, play is the director of the Cardiovascular Research Institute. Um, I've been here a long time. Actually, I came here straight out of training, and I won't tell you how long I've been here, but it's more than 20 years. Um, and the, uh, I've been the director of the CVRI now for five years, and the CVRI made a request of community medical school to participate uh, actively in this process, and we're very pleased they, that they've allowed us to do some thematic lectures. So for those of you who joined us in February, it was Heart Month, and we did a Heart Talk during that month. May is actually Stroke Month, and so today you'll hear a bit about stroke, and if you come back in the fall in October, we'll talk a bit about clotting such as DVT, that kind of thing. So those are thematically cardiovascular um, areas. The Cardiovascular Research Institute has a pretty simple mission. Our, go our goal really is to foster cardiovascular research inside the University of Vermont. And what we're really about is improving care of patients in the community. And what we're trying to highlight is some of the work that we're doing through these talks. And um, what you'll see today and through most of our talks is a thematic connection between basic science work that's being done in the, at the bench in a laboratory and how that can apply to taking better care of patients so that in the future we're doing better and better care. Um, and there's remarkable things going on in cardiovascular research within the University of Vermont. And so this is a little bit of a way for us to take the bushel basket off our lantern and let you guys see some of the great work that's going on here. Um, and so today we're really fortunate to have uh, a couple of uh, individuals who work in the area of stroke. Dr. Abby Marcellini is um, an interesting collection of skills. She's an emergency room doctor and she's also uh, a neurocritical care specialist. So she takes care of strokes as they present in the emergency department and also in the early phases when they're critically ill. And so she brings a very strong clinical emphasis to what she does. Dr. Marilyn Cipolla is a PhD researcher who's done incredible research at understanding how the brain, and particularly the blood vessels in the br brain, respond to the injury and what the early phases and, her th and, a, and the translational thrust of that, how does that apply to doing better, is she's looking at ways to help people recover more effectively after a stroke. And her work is actually moving, I would say, fairly rapidly towards clinical use, and, and it can, it's very exciting in terms of what it can bring us. So as much as I'd like to continue talking, I think my time is up, and I'll turn it over to the two of these guys. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. And, and let me speak on behalf of Dr. Cipolla and myself. We are both just thrilled to be here. We are standing here and talking about how exciting it is to be able to talk to you guys. And um, we were told that half of you actually come back for many of these talks. You're not just, uh, you're not just here to see us. <laughs> but um, I think that's really, really exciting, and, and I love being a part of it. So uh, thank you for coming and spending the time with us tonight. This is Sydney. Sydney and his wife woke up one morning about 7.30. She went downstairs to make breakfast. And about 8.30, she said, where is he? Couldn't find him, went back upstairs and found him down on the ground and he couldn't move one whole side, okay? And his speech was slurred. How many of you in this room know somebody who has had a stroke? All right, that's, that's a lot. How many of you are concerned 
that you might have a stroke. All of us are. Those of you who aren't raising your hands are lying. <laughs> We're all worried about this. And what Dr. Cipolla and I want to do tonight is go over everything from soup to nuts, from how do you think about stroke, and when you see somebody who's doing something that doesn't seem quite right, should you pull that call bell and should you call 911? Or is it something else, right? I'm here to tell you the simple answer to that is you should always call, irrespective. Now, I'm the person in the emergency department who the patients come to. And half of the patients who come into the emergency department that are stroke alerts, that's what we call a patient who comes in who's a stroke alert, are not strokes. And we are very happy about that. We want there to be an overcall. So hear this message. If you think somebody might be having a stroke, pick up the phone and call 911 all the time, every time, because that's what we want. We would rather have an overcall and have a lot of people coming in and then we figure out that they're not having a stroke than to miss a stroke. So that's a really, really important message and probably you know, the most important message here. But we're gonna talk about everything from what do you do when you think it's going on, what do we do when the patient comes into the emergency department, and then how do we treat those patients when they're in the hospital, and what's going on in the research to help move our science forward. So hopefully we'll give you everything you need. And we're gonna have questions at the end. So take notes, don't forget your questions because we really wanna get to those. Okay. So good evening everybody, I'm Marilyn Cipolla um, and I also want to uh, welcome everybody and say what a pri privilege it really is to be here, a privilege to do this with, with Evie, Dr. Dr. Murphy and me. Um, so let's start with talking about, oops, going backwards. Um, the impact of stroke. Um, everybody here pretty much raised their hand when Evie asked about um, knowing somebody who had a stroke or in fear of having a stroke. Well, stroke is actually quite prevalent in our population. There are 750,000 new strokes that are diagnosed each year. Every 45 seconds, someone suffers a stroke. Every three minutes, someone dies from a stroke. Stroke is the second leading cause of death worldwide, and it's the leading cause of long-term disability. About, there's about four million stroke survivors in the US, and it costs about an estimated $34 billion a year. Each year, you may not know this, about 40,000 more women than men have a, have a stroke, and more women than men die from a stroke each year. So, Evie's gonna take over again and talk about strokes, what is a stroke, and then I'm gonna get a look at, talk about the research that we're doing that uh, Dr. Schneider was talking about. So we're trying not to stand too close to each other because we don't want our mics to have interference. <laughs> so what is a stroke? The blood vessels that carry blood into the brain can get blocked. They can get blocked or they can rupture and bleed and that means blood's not getting to the brain. That's what a stroke is. The very basic. We're going to talk about different types of stroke, different locations of stroke, but the basic knowledge is that blood is not getting to a certain area of the brain. Now, if you look up here, this is a thrombus, and ischemic stroke means that there's a, a clot. It's either a thrombus or an embolus. And we'll go to the next slide. Um, the thrombus means that a clot forms in the place where it affects the brain. An embolus is a clot that forms somewhere else and travels to a place in the brain and lodges there and gets stuck. Either way, wherever that clot gets stuck in the artery, everything beyond it that usually gets supplied with blood is not getting supplied with blood. So that part of the brain dies. That's what we call an ischemic stroke. A hemorrhagic stroke is a bleed. It's a blood vessel that ruptures. So I'm gonna go back here. Um, sorry. The, um, let's go back to the ischemic. Let's stick with the clots. If that clot gets stuck in a large vessel, we call that an LVO or a large vessel occlusion. 
that's going to have a big effect on the patient's ability to function. So somebody who loses the function of their whole right side, can't move their leg, can't move their arm, that's probably a large vessel occlusion. It's blocking a big artery that's controlling the whole half of the body, of the motor function. The other type of clot can be a small vessel, a, one of the tiny vessels that goes deep into the brain that either gets stuck with a clot or it bleeds. And those are not, those are the type of strokes that maybe will cause you to have some slurred speech or maybe vision isn't so good. Um, it, it all depends on where it is. But the reason that there's a big difference between the large vessel occlusion and the small vessel problems is we have a way to fix the large vessel occlusion, and we'll talk about that. But those are two types, large vessels and small vessels, when we're thinking about clots. But there's also bleeds, strokes that are caused by a hemorrhage or the blood vessel rupturing. Now here, we have a picture of an aneurysm. Some of you have probably heard of an aneurysm. You may know people who have had an aneurysm. And actually, 2% of us in this room have an aneurysm in our brain. It's not a big deal. Most of them don't rupture. But it's when those aneurysms rupture that it can cause a hemorrhagic stroke. So if this thing ruptures and bleeds, all of the brain that's supplied distal to that, that's not going to get blood supply, and it's not going to get oxygen, and that part of the brain may die. So that's a hemorrhagic stroke. It's not as common as the ischemic stroke, but it has more mortality, more morbidity. The other thing that can happen is some of these, these are called the, the these are the small vessels that I was talking about right in the deep part of the brain. Those can bleed. And so they can, get, they can get clots or they can bleed. If they bleed in the deep part of the brain, that's when you have um, a stroke that has different type of, of uh, functional problems. So if you see somebody that has an inability to move their arm and their leg, and they can't speak, that's likely a large vessel. But somebody who has a small vessel bleed like this, they might not be able to speak well, they may have slurred speech, they may have comprehension difficulty, they may have some other subtle things, but typically they won't have a motor problem. But it's not for you guys to figure out which vessels are blocked. Remember, the most important thing is, if you think somebody's having a stroke, call 911, get them to the emergency department so we can use our testing and, and figure out what's going on. Is it an ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke? Is it a clot or is it a bleed? Because you can't really tell until you get a CAT scan. You need to get a CAT scan to tell if it's a clot versus a bleed. So who is at risk? I know you're all going to be reading these lists and saying, oh, do I have this? Do I have that? Am I at risk? We all do this. And I made this list, both of these lists, sort of over here are the things that we can't really control. We're born with this. This is our genetic makeup. But on this side, some of these things we can control. Stress, unhealthy diet, tobacco, all of those things contribute to stroke. And there's one thing that contributes to stroke that I'd like to say is really important that we can do something about. And I see people all the time who come in and they have high blood pressure. They have chronic high blood pressure. And I say, they come into the emergency department, and I say, do you take any medication? And they say, well, I don't really take it because I don't like to take medications. I say, OK, fair enough. I don't like to take medications either. But what I think they don't see is if 
blood pressure is not controlled. And we have great medications to control blood pressure. If we control the blood pressure, we decrease the risk of stroke. And I think that if those people who don't like to take the medications could see the alternative, to see what might happen because blood pressure's too high, they might take their medications. And, and you know, I don't take blood pressure medication, so I don't know. I'm speaking, you know, I'm speaking out of turn. But if I had one wish for everybody who I see in the emergency department, it's that they control blood pressure because there are so many diseases that happen because of uncontrolled blood pressure. And stroke is one of them. And, and we don't want to wait until it's too late. So let's just go back again and talk about three different types of stroke. I told you two of them already. Remember we talked about the ischemic stroke. There's an area where there's a clot. There's a big clot. And the blood flow is obstructed, can't get by. This is a hemorrhagic stroke where you've got a rupture of a vessel. Now, high blood pressure contributes to this, we think, because chronic high blood pressure breaks down that in, inner wall of the artery, and it makes it very brittle. And it makes it such that when, when your arteries dilate and constrict and dilate and constrict, somebody who's got chronic hypertension and add to that maybe high, high cholesterol, the inner lining of this blood vessel doesn't do so well, and it gets kind of brittle. And we think our, our best science right now says that chronic high blood pressure is associated with ruptured vessels. So here's the hemorrhagic. We've talked about those. I want to talk about a third type, and that's a dissection. Has anyone heard of dissection? Yeah, yeah, it's out there. Um, what happens is this. Remember, we have the three layers of the blood vessels, and the blood's heading this way. For some reason, that inner layer ruptures. Okay, you still have the outer two layers. So maybe that doesn't bleed like this one, but it makes a little dissection. And so now you've got a separation of the inner layer and the middle layer. And that separation can sort of separate externally, and it can eventually bleed, or it can just separate like this, and what forms in here is a clot. Now, if you look at this, blood is still going past there, but not for long, because when you form a clot in a blood vessel, like this one, that attracts more platelets, and the clot gets bigger. And when that clot gets bigger, this gets bigger, and eventually you close off this lumen. That's a dissection. Now, the other thing that can happen is, if you form a clot here and it gets bigger, little bits of that clot can break off and head further deep into the brain. So this is why with stroke, you can have one big stroke or you can have showering. You can have multiple little strokes. And when people have symptoms for stroke, it's not just one symptom, it's multiple different things. And the dissection is unique because it can happen in young people. We are seeing a lot of young people have dissection of vertebral arteries, the two arteries in the back of your neck. You can have a dissection in the carotid arteries too. That's more common in older folks. But the dissection is kind of tricky because if you have a dissection in a vertebral artery, probably not going to affect the movement of your arm or leg, it's going to make you dizzy or nauseous or vomiting. And when somebody's got nausea and vomiting, what do you think is the most common thing for people to say it's causing it? What's that? Flu. Flu. Flu's a big one. What else? Stomach, Stomach stuff, right? Food poisoning. It's always food poisoning. What did I eat, right? But what we have to start recognizing is, if this dizziness started all of a sudden, it's probably not food poisoning, it's probably not the flu, it might be a stroke. And it's harder to figure out. Again, not your job, that's my job. 
So the dissection is an important thing. And we talk about dissection of the carotid artery or the vertebral artery. Where it happens will cause different symptoms. So let's talk a little bit about stroke location. What you have in your anatomy is four main arteries that feed the brain. You have two carotids in the front of the neck and two vertebrals in the back. And that's a good thing, because if you lose one carotid, you still have three other large vessels to feed the brain. When God designed us, she designed it that way. <laughs> so depending on which of these arteries has a clot that travels up the artery into the brain, that depends on where that clot's going to land. If you look at it from the side here, here's the carotid arteries, and here's the vertebral. Kind of goes through the, the spine for a bit, and then it comes here. The carotid artery distribution feeds what we call the anterior part of the brain. And if somebody has an anterior stroke, they're more likely to have those motor function problems. Can't move my arm, can't move my leg, can't speak. If somebody has a posterior from a vertebral artery problem, they're affecting the cerebellum. And the cerebellum is responsible for balance and dizziness, weakness, nausea, vomiting, this kind of thing. So those are the two general distributions of stroke. However, there are connections, so it's not all as clean as that. So we think of the anterior as the motor type stuff, and we think of the posterior as the weak and dizzies. That's very broad and very general. The important thing to remember about posterior is it's not as obvious, right? It's just not as obvious, and we have to be thinking of it. So, Sydney, what kind of a stroke does he have? I'm, I'm hearing large, large vessel occlusion, yes. And I'm also hearing anterior, yes, absolutely. He's having a large vessel occlusion anterior stroke. What about this guy? This guy's golfing. It's about four in the afternoon. He bent over to pick up a golf ball, and when he stood back up, he was dizzy. And he said, oh, must be the flu. Just kidding. No, he said, he said, oh, I must be dehydrated. So he goes to the clubhouse, and he has a lemonade, and he sits down for a while. He still doesn't feel better. He's still dizzy. It's kind of like this. The room's spinning, right? And he says, oh, I'm just tired. I just traveled. I took care of this patient. I just traveled. I came back from Morocco, where I was visiting my daughter in college. And I'm tired, and I was dehydrated. I just need to go home and have a meal. So he goes home, and he has a meal. And that doesn't help. So he said, I must need to sleep. I must be really sleep deprived. So he goes to sleep and wakes up later, and he's still dizzy. And the next morning, his wife says, what's wrong with you? And, she, and he said, well, I'm just a little bit dizzy. She said, you're going to the emergency department. And sure enough, he had a posterior vertebral artery dissection. And the dissection caused a clot to go to his brain and caused him to be dizzy. So this is what happens. But can you see how it could be really easy to think, oh, it's dizziness. Oh, I'm dehydrated. Oh, food poisoning, something like that. Very easy. So back to the first thing that we said. If you think somebody's having a stroke, just bring them in and let us figure it out. This is one of the sort of public ads that's out there that helps people to understand what a stroke is. And you think about facial weakness. So if you ask somebody to smile, and they can smile with both sides of their face, that's good. But if they're smiling and there's one side that's drooping, that, that may be a stroke. 
arm weakness, just ask them to lift up their arms. Can you lift both arms? And if one arm doesn't lift very well, that could be a stroke. Um, same thing with legs, but arms is easy. Speech difficulties. Today is a sunny day in Burlington. If they can't say that and repeat after you, or if you know that their speech is slurred because you know what they sound like every day, that could be a stroke. And time, call 911. So this, any one of these can be a stroke, but the other thing that's really, really, really important is time, and that's in many different ways. So first of all, if something happens all of a sudden, right? And, and when people say, well, I've got nausea and vomiting, dizziness, I say, what were you doing when it first started? They say, well, I don't know. It's been going on for a few days. They can't remember what they were doing or where they were when it first started. It's probably not sudden onset, all right? But if they say, I was standing in the bathroom, brushing my teeth at nine o'clock in the morning, getting ready to go downstairs, and all of a sudden, something hit me like a ton of bricks, and I was on the ground. Okay, that's a sudden onset, would you agree? Yeah, so just what, what were they doing when it first started? If it's a sudden onset, you have to think, well, it might be one of those clots that traveled through and got stuck. And right when it got stuck, that's when they started with the symptoms. Or there was a bleed, a rupture of an artery. And when that happened, that's when they got symptoms. So if you think time, you think sudden onset, some of these things going on, that might be a stroke. Don't try to guess, just bring them in. Call 911. This is the most important thing to do. How many of you know somebody, I'm not saying you did this, but how many of you know somebody who something happened, maybe uh, somebody was having a heart attack or chest pain or, or headache or stroke, and they called their relative who lives six states over, <laughs> right? We all do it, we all do it. That's not who we want you to call. We want you to call 911, and here's why. And we'll talk more about this, but the sooner we get to that patient who's having a stroke, the better chance we have of saving neurons. The better chance we have. It's all about time. The faster we get to them, the better chance we have. So timing is really everything. And, and one of the things that you can think about is, when was the last time I saw this person at their baseline or normal? Because if the last time they were normal was one o'clock in the afternoon, that's when we set the clock. And we have certain therapies that we can use and do, but they're based on how long has this been going on? And we'll talk more about that. Evie, that was amazing. <laughs> Did everybody just learn a ton about stroke, right? Yes. Me too. <laughs> um, so we talk, in the stroke field, we talk about time is brain. Um, the title of this really is time is brain. Um, that's because with a stroke, time loss is brain loss. About two million neurons are lost every minute of a, of a large vessel occlusion, LVO, that Evie was just talking about. Um, the question that we have is why? Does anybody know why the brain is so sensitive to loss of blood flow? Sure, but, but more than that, it's the neurons. The most major cell type in the brain is, is called a neuron. Um, this is just a diagram of neuron. This isn't a real neuron, this is a diagram of a neuron. And notice how they're all interconnected. So they, they function in networks. And they're highly metabolic. So they have very high metabolism because they're so important and they're doing so many things all at the same time. They also have a very limited capacity to store energy, unlike muscle. Muscle stores energy very well. You can get up and walk very readily without having to do much. It stores energy. Neurons don't do this. And again, everybody, a lot of people said oxygen, right? So when the oxygen supply to those neurons is lost from an occlusion or a rupture, it's the only blood supply that these neurons have and it's lost. And so these neurons die very rapidly. 
Now, not all tissue in the brain is the same in terms of blood, uh, in terms of, of loss of, of, uh, of function. Um, we talk about two different regions in the brain. Um, the core infarction here, which is the dead tissue, and this is from a large vessel occlusion. Um, this is the, what's called the core, and these neurons have died, and they're not coming back, okay? Um, then there's this region outside of the, uh, of the core infarction, this dead tissue, called the penumbra. And this is a region where the blood supply isn't so low that it's killing the neurons, but it stuns the neurons. So they can't really function very well, but they're not dead yet. And I'm gonna talk uh, a little bit uh, later about salvaging this penumbra region. What we can do to salvage this penumbra. We can't do a lot to salvage this dead tissue, but what happens over time if we don't do anything f to salvage this penumbra? This core infarction, this dead tissue, expands and it encompasses this entire penumbra. So a lot of us in the stroke field are working on how we salvage the penumbra and keep this dead tissue from expanding. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later. But Evie's gonna come back, she's gonna talk a little bit about treatments and then I'm gonna talk about the research we're doing to, to work on the penumbra. So the first thing we do when this patient comes by ambulance to the emergency department is we get a CAT scan. This is, this is not the CAT scan that we get, but we get a plain CAT scan and what we're looking for is does this patient have a bleed or not, okay? If they have a bleed, if, if they have a brain bleed, then we go down a certain pathway to take care of that patient. If they don't, then we think they have a clot because they have signs of stroke and there's no bleed. And so we figure, oh, there must be a clot in there. And we do a CT with contrast to look at the vessels. And when we look at the vessels, and again, this is not a CT with contrast, but kind of looks like this. When we see the vessels, you can see this is the right side. This is actually an angiogram. So this is going into the angio suite and putting a catheter in the femoral artery, going up and shooting contrast into the brain, all right? So that we can look at the right side of the brain. Now. You see a lot of blood vessels here, but nothing's going on here. And that's because there's a clot. So this is how we find where the clot is. And the best thing to do is to get that clot out. Now, until 2015, we didn't have a great way to get the clot out. But in 2015, we had three big studies, actually five big studies that showed us that you can go in with something called a stent retriever and actually grab the clot and pull it out. And if you can imagine, the sooner we do that, the, the more of that penumbra we're gonna save. Because that penumbra that Marilyn said is not dead yet, it can die. But if we reperfuse it, if we get oxygen going back to it, it won't die. That's our goal. We're not saving that core. We're not saving the dead tissue. We're saving the penumbra. So how do we do that? This is a stent retriever. So remember I said you go into the femoral artery and you put this catheter up. This is the catheter. And then it gets to the clot. This is the clot. And this is a very uh, micro wire stent. This is the latest technology. And that stent goes through the clot, and then when they deploy, that stent just expands, and it kind of grabs the clot. And when it grabs the clot, it's pulling it away from the walls of the artery, and right then and there, you now have blood flow. So it's a really wonderful technique. And you're pulling that, then, then it's, it's like chicken wire, and it's, it's kind of like, a little bit like the stents that, that are used in, in the cardiac world, too. But now you grab this clot, and this balloon is blown up during this process to stop the flow of blood so it's not getting in the way. Then you deflate the balloon, you pull that out, and now the clot is out, and you have an open artery, and the blood is flowing, and you're perfusing that penumbra.
This is endovascular therapy, or some people call it mechanical thrombectomy. Thrombectomy meaning you're taking the thrombus and you're, you're getting it out. And this is a good technology for those large vessel occlusions. We can't use it for the small vessels. They're too small. You can't get in there. And you can't really pull clot out of small vessels. But if somebody has a large vessel occlusion, those are the people we can get this out. Now, the other thing is a little more old fashioned, it's been around since the mid 90s, is TPA. And I know you've heard of TPA. It's thrombolysis, meaning we're breaking up the clot with a chemical. And, and this is just used in the IV. We inject a bolus of TPA. It goes to the clot where it is, and it starts breaking it down. We've been using this since the mid-90s. Now, there's a little bit of controversy around TPA, because if you think about it, if I'm going to inject something in the vessel that can break up clot, it can also cause bleeding elsewhere, right? So it might cause bleeding in the brain, it might cause bleeding somewhere else. So people are a little bit worried about that. I will tell you, that it's only about 3% of the patients who get TPA that eventually have a bleed. The rest of them, it either helps by dissolving the clot or it doesn't really make, have an effect at all. Now when you have a large vessel occlusion, think of it kind of like liquid plumber, all right? How much liquid plumber do you need for a big old you know, clog? Yeah, you, you kind of need a lot. And sometimes it doesn't help, and you've got to get the plunger, right? Right? <laughs> it's kind of how I think of it. So TPA has been around forever. We still use TPA. If somebody comes in today with a large vessel occlusion, and they, they meet the criteria, they will have TPA. They will get TPA. They will be offered TPA. Now, you can always decline. You can always say, I don't want TPA. But this is the standard of care. This is what we do. And then we're trying to figure out, is this a large vessel occlusion or not? And we send them for another CT with contrast or CTA. Sometimes we'll even get an MRI or a different CT to look at, well, how long has this been going on? And we'll make a, a decision on whether or not to take them to get thrombectomy. This is a nice picture of a juicy clot that was pulled out of somebody's brain with a stent retriever, okay? So, so we give TPA, and maybe that works, maybe it doesn't, and how do we know it works? Well, we're, we're doing an, an exam. We're asking you, smile, lift your arms up, and if you can't lift your arms up, and you know, this one doesn't go up, and then we give you the TPA, and all of a sudden now you're lifting your arms up again. Well, gosh, the TPA probably worked, and then we're going to continue to watch. But there's a lot of different things that can happen with stroke. The major thing we do, though, is the TPA and plus or minus the thrombectomy. Now, in order to get TPA, we have to get to the patient within four and a half hours. So. Remember we talked about the last time the patient was seen normal, seen at their baseline? If that was at one o'clock in the afternoon, I've got to get that TPA on board by 5.30. Because at six o'clock, we don't give it. At six o'clock, the risk is too high for a bleed, and we want to be safe. And the other thing is, every 15 minutes that we wait longer to give the TPA, it's not as effective. It's more effective if you give it right away. So that's why it's always really helpful to know when was the last time that patient was seen normal. Well, what if you went to bed at eight o'clock and you woke up in the morning with signs of stroke? When was the last time seen normal? Eight hours ago, depending on how long you sleep, right? 
So that's not somebody that we can give TPA to very easily. We do have some advanced imaging techniques that can help us get to how old is the stroke and you know when did it happen. But in general, four and a half hours is our cutoff. But thrombectomy is much longer. We can do thrombectomy on patients up to 24 hours. Okay? So this is really very cool thing. All right? It's a wonderful technique. And it's absolutely, I have seen people, young people, who have had stroke, large vessel occlusion, and who would otherwise have been neurologically devastated and had thrombectomy, and, and they walked out of the hospital with nothing but a, a, a facial droop, a slight facial droop. It, it's really amazing. But the first step is we gotta get these patients to us. Yeah. So how do we do that? Well, I told you, call 911 to call the ambulance. And, and, and you're thinking, well, I don't know, I could probably drive to the hospital faster than calling the ambulance, waiting for them to get to me, et cetera. But th there's more to it than that. When the ambulance gets there, they are trained and skilled at determining if a patient has signs of stroke, all right? They're gonna do a finger stick blood glucose because if somebody has a really low blood sugar, they can look like they're having a stroke, for sure. And they're gonna be able to use this app that we're piloting now called FASTED. They put the exam into this app, and depending on where you are, this app will tell you where is the closest hospital. And it'll give you a map, a GPS, on how to get there. Because, you know, Vermont's a big state. There are a lot of rural areas. And not every hospital has the capability to do endovascular thrombectomy. And if you have a large vessel occlusion, you want to go to the place that can do thrombectomy. If you have a smaller stroke, you want to go to the closest place to maybe get TPA. So this app, is, it's a pilot project right now. And we're trying to figure out Wherever you are in the state, where is the best hospital for you to go to? Now, if you want to have endovascular thrombectomy, you come here, because we, we provide that. But smaller hospitals don't have that capability. It takes a specially trained person to do this, as a, either a neurologist or a neurosurgeon or a radiologist who's specially trained in doing that procedure. So you can't have them everywhere, right? That's why if you're having a large vessel occlusion, we don't want you to go to the closest hospital. We want you to come here. We're still working the kinks out. This is, this is a pilot project. But this is how the science is advancing, even with EMS. But right now, what they do when they get the patient in the ambulance and they do the, the simple test to say, this patient is having a stroke or has signs of stroke, they call me. I'm here in the emergency department and they call me and they say, coming in with a patient who has a stroke. And so I say, okay, we're alerting everybody. Radiology, the registrar, myself, nursing, um, neurology, the stroke team, we all meet you at the door. And we go to work fast. We go to work very fast because time is brain. So that's why it's so important to call the ambulance and not call your cousin in California. <laughs> I, I, I say that jokingly, but r people do, because they're like, I don't know, am, am I having a stroke? Maybe I, I want my cousin to tell me I'm not having a stroke, right? <laughs> and so call the ambulance and, and get to us. And I repeat it, I want you to come here if you're not having a stroke. I want to tell you you're not having a stroke. I would much rather you come instead of not coming and you were having a stroke. So when was the patient last seen normal? That's, that's a question that EMS is going to ask you. Okay, thank you. So we're gonna switch gears a little bit and, and talk about some science. So I'm a vascular biologist. What that means is I study the blood vessels in the brain. And stroke is a vascular disease. We, have you talked about the blood vessels that are blocked they're, or they're hemorrhaged or they, they burst? I study those blood vessels, um, and 
One of the things we're doing now is trying to understand or trying to use and take advantage of what's already there in terms of reperfusion therapies. So the endovascular therapy and the, um, the TPA therapy, those are reperfusion therapies, okay? So we're focused on reperfusion therapies because we know those work, okay? They are the most effective. So we're trying to take advantage of what's already there, and this is a, a very simple diagram of the blood vessels in the brain. These are the big blood vessels of the carotid artery. These gray ones are the vertebrals in the back. Um, and these circles uh, represent where there are connections between these large artery perfused territories. So this is the middle cerebral artery territory and the anterior cerebral artery territory. And why they're so important, these connections, is because if you have a blockage, a large vessel occlusion in the middle cerebral artery, there can be retrograde flow from the other territory, the anterior cerebral artery territory, to sustain the blood flow and limit the damage and salvage that tissue in the penumbra I was talking about. So these little connections, they're called collaterals, or we call them peel collaterals because they lie on top of the brain, are really important for stroke and stroke outcome. So this is a, one of these uh, CT imaging um, that, that Evie showed, and I want to show you the importance of this. This is the same patient that had a large vessel occlusion, and again, they've been injected with a dye so you can see the blood vessels. And you can see this is taken over time. And so you can see where there's an occlusion here because there's a region in the brain that's devoid of blood vessels or dye in those blood vessels, so you can't see them because of this large vessel occlusion. But notice over time you start seeing some of these blood vessels. But that occlusion is still there. So how did those blood vessels get the dye in them? Well, they came from the other vascular territory. It's that retrograde flow. And it's really important. We know now that the collateral, what we call collateral status, or how open those collaterals are, is the strongest predictor for outcome of stroke. Patients with these good collaterals, they have better reperfusion, they have smaller infarcts, and less hemorrhagic transformation. That's bleeding. And patients with poor collaterals, they do poor even, even if you do recanalize and you reperfuse, regardless of the endovascular therapy or the TPA. They'll do poorly even if they have, if they have poor collaterals. So we study these collaterals in the lab. Um, we use a rat model, um, and this is actually a photomicrograph from our laboratory. Um, and these are the blood vessels that lie on top of the brain. It's through the microscope because they're very small. This is a vein. This is a branch of the middle cerebral artery. This is a branch of the anterior cerebral artery. And in the middle, this is one of these collaterals that I was talking about that provide that retrograde flow during an occlusion, so that if the middle cerebral artery was occluded, blood flow can go this way and still per perfuse that penumbra. So we actually, we study these. We dissect these out of the brain, and we study their structure and their function. And this is, so this is a blood vessel. This is one of these peel collaterals. It's been mounted on glass cannulas. It's pressurized. It's perfused. It's kept alive all day so we can study it. We can study its constrictor properties. We can study its structure. Uh, and just to give you an idea of um, the size of this, this is 50 microns here, and it's about the size of this blood vessel. It's about the size of, of my hair. It's about the size of a human hair, just so you know. This, these are very small blood vessels. But they're very functional, and they're very important. And so one of the first studies we did, looking at these peel collaterals, was we compared the constriction of these blood vessels from a normal rat normal rat, just a normal rat, normal blood pressure, normal glucose, just a normal person, a young, healthy male, let's say, okay? We also looked at a rat with hypertension, chronic hypertension. Evie talked about hypertension, the, the importance of hypertension in stroke and how it drives a lot of the stroke risk. So we're very interested in rats with hypertension and, ha and how they, their blood vessels are affected by the hypertension because that's what drives stroke. It's a primary cause of stroke is hypertension. So we looked at, at these peel collaterals from these normal rats and these hypertensive rats, and I'm gonna show you some data, okay? A couple graphs here. Um, so what we do is, is we measure the change in the inner diameter, so it's here. This is the diameter, and these, again, remember, they're alive. These blood vessels are alive, so they actually constrict, okay? And they constrict when we increase the pressure, 
Okay, that may seem odd to you, but actually blood vessels are very responsive to pressure. It's your blood pressure. You know, when you stand or you, or you sit, when you stand up and you get a little bit dizzy, those are your blood vessels who are, that are delayed and dilating a little bit because they're responding to the pressure. Okay, so we look at pressure as a stimulus because it's one of the things that we look at. Okay, it's important. And you can see that, that when we look at the inner diameter, when we increase pressure in an animal, this is a WKY, this is, a, this is one of those normal animals, okay, that the, there's a little bit of an increase with the increase in pressure, but pretty much diameter doesn't, doesn't change, right? So it's about 40 microns, 40, 50 microns. And then we also measure the tone in these vessels. And by the tone, I mean how constricted are they? Okay, how vasoconstricted are they? And for these vessels, they are about anywhere from you know, 15 to 20, up to 20% tone at, at the most, okay? So they're about 20% constricted, which actually is not very much for a brain blood vessel, but it's okay. When we looked at the blood vessels from a hypertensive rat, there was a big difference. So first of all, when we increase pressure, first of all, they're very small, right? They're only 20 to 30 microns in diameter. And when you increase pressure, they actually constrict to the increased pressure. This is actually what's called the myogenic response. It's a well-known response of brain blood vessels. These blood vessels from the normal rats really kind of don't have much of that. And you don't want them to have much of that because they're collaterals. You want them to be able to re redirect blood flow when there's an occlusion, so you want them open. You don't want them to actually have a lot of tone. But the hypertensive rats actually have a ton of tone, over 50%. So these are the blood vessels that are perfusing the penumbra, and they're vasoconstricted in the hypertensive rats. So this may not be causing the stroke, but it certainly isn't helping the stroke. So in fact, hypertensive rats don't have much of a penumbra. And they don't have much of a penumbra because they're so va the, the peel collaterals are so vasoconstricted. And this was a, a, actually a real surprise to the field because the stroke field has always assumed, up until this study, that it was all about structure that structurally these blood vessels were smaller or, and that they weren't vasoactive, what we call vasoactive, that they couldn't be this constricted, but they are. So this actually was a good finding. And it's a good finding because what we're trying to do is now open those collaterals. So if they were structurally smaller, you couldn't make them bigger by a pharmacologic agent or some sort of treatment. But we, we can. And so the next question we had was, can collateral flow be increased during stroke to increase and salvage brain tissue and or buy time? So that those, vaso that those blood vessels from the hypertensive rats are vasoconstricted suggests they can be open and maybe we can salvage some tissue. So we tried this. So we use a, a, a rat model of a large vessel occlusion, okay? This is a rat brain here. This is the base of the brain. This is what's called the circle of Willis. This is this, it's called an anastomotic loop. It, it allows for blood flow to be, be redistributed when you have this, this occlusion here. This is a filament that's been surgically implanted into the rat. It, it actually in, goes in through the internal carotid artery and it's advanced until it occludes the middle cerebral artery, which is here. This is one of the middle cerebral arteries. This is the other middle cerebral artery. So this rat had a large vessel occlusion of the middle cerebral artery. This is a really important model of stroke. It's very big in the field. We, a lot of us use it because it approximates clinical stroke. It induces brain lesions that are very similar to human stroke. It allows for reperfusion, so we can pull this suture out at other time points, just like endovascular therapy. We pull that suture out to allow for reperfusion. So we use this model. And so we also use this model to measure changes in blood flow during the stroke to look at whether or not we can increased collateral blood flow through those little peel collaterals, okay? And I know this is a little bit busy, but this is how we actually determine regions on the brain and where to place flow probes, okay? We use something called laser Doppler. Um, it's, it's how we measure changes in blood flow. And we use two probes, laser Doppler probes. One, the first probe is in the middle cerebral artery territory. This is the core infarcted territory. This is the unsalvageable tissue, okay? The second probe is placed in the anterior cerebral artery territory, just beyond those peel collaterals, or what we call the LMAs. So this is the, the penumbra region, okay? So we wanna be able to measure simultaneously what's happening in the core and what's happening in the penumbra, okay? Um, and then what we did was we measured the collateral flow um, during an occlusion, so we occluded the middle cerebral artery, and then we treated with a compound called sanguinate. 
Now, sanguinate is a uh, proprietary compound. Um, I, I've been working with the drug company um, who makes it. Um, it's, a, it's an oxygen carrier, actually. It delivers oxygen to the, to the tissue, the hypoxic tissue, okay? Um, it also has vasoactive properties. So we hypothesized that the sanguinate would actually be able to open those collaterals and increase collateral flow. So lo and behold, this, these are the, this is the change in cerebral blood flow in the penumbral territory, in the collateral territory. And we use the SHR. This is a spontaneously hypertensive rat. Okay, so this is that hypertensive rat with those vasoconstricted collaterals. And when we gave a vehicle, which is just a control, um, you can see that the collateral, when we gave, when, during the occlusion, there was no change in cerebral blood flow, really. If anything, it went down, meaning increased or uh, change in blood flow in the penumbra didn't happen. But when we gave the sanguinate, there was, during the occlusion, remember, the, the filament is still in. It's like you came to the hospital with that clot in your brain. And we gave the sanguinate, and we could increase collateral flow. So we could actually increase, we could cause vasodilation of those peel collaterals to increase the collateral flow. We could also improve reperfusion, okay? So we talked a little bit about reperfusion therapies. The idea is to get that clot out, get oxygenated blood to that ischemic tissue, and to salvage as much as possible. And so this is a graph showing the change in cerebral blood flow, but this is the MCA territory. This is the territory of, of the core infarction, okay? This is where we put the filament in. It drops down to you know, over 80% drop in cerebral blood flow. We leave the filament in for 90 minutes. We pull the filament out to allow for reperfusion. And you can see that the vehicle treated animals, it didn't reperfuse, not nearly what it started at, and it declined over time. This is what's called no reflow. It's also an important concept in, in stroke is that even though you recanalize or you pull that clot out, the distal tissue's not, not perfused. And that's happening here. But with the sanguinate, you can see that we actually improve reperfusion, and we can keep reperfusion high. Well, did we salvage tissue? We actually did. So this is the rat brain. The white area is the infarcted tissue. Okay, this is a, a dye. This is called a vital dye. The cells that are alive take up the dye, metabolize it, and turn the tissue red. The cells that are dead can't take up the dye, and so it remains white. And in this way, we can actually measure the size of the infarct, okay? And you can see when we compared the SHR with the vehicle treated to the sanguinate treated, we had a significant re reduction in this infarction. I mean, we actually salvage tissue. So we can open those collaterals and we can salvage tissue. And I'm gonna stop there. Um, I can't do any of this work without the support that I have from the NIH, the National Institutes of, of Health, um, the NINDS, and the uh, Heart, Lung, and Blood, and the Cardiovascular Research Institute. Um, this is my lab group. They do all the work. I don't know if they're here or not, but um, they do all the work. Um, I can never keep up with current pictures, so I make many me's of them. Um, but they do a great job. They're wonderful. And I think we want, I mean, I want to thank you very much. And we will take questions. <laughs> Hi, I have two questions actually. One is, do you think there is a correlation between concussion and stroke? And two is, in terms of, um, I would heard for, from something different that uh, crawling can help with uh, developed neural pathways, and I don't know if that's the same uh, as what happens during a stroke, but if that might be something that you could do prophylactically, you know, just begin developing those neural pathways to, so that you can connect your brain. You want to take the first one, I'll take the second one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the first one, when you ask, is concussion associated with stroke? Um, concussion is when somebody has trauma to the brain, and it results in a stunning or seeing stars, or maybe they even pass out. You know, there's a wide range of concussion. There's many different severities of concussion. And if the concussion had an area of bleed, 
So if you got hit hard enough in the head that you had a, a traumatic bleed, which is a different bleed from what we're talking about, um, then that could cause a little bit of stroke. But concussion that doesn't cause a bleed, I don't know if we have any science that says that it's associated with stroke. I don't know if I'm answering your question or maybe you have a specific. No, I was um, just wondering. Yeah. Right, and there's a lot of research, as you know, about concussion and its later effects on on brain, and in, in the neural pathways and different different effects. But we don't have, as far as I know, any direct connection between concussion and risk of developing stroke later. Yeah. So your second question about neural networks and can you build neural networks that will be protective of stroke prophylactically? I think that you can build neural networks, you can change your neural networks, but that's probably not gonna help prophylactically if you have a stroke because it's all about oxygen getting to those neural networks and it doesn't matter kind of how many you have, if you have a, a low enough oxygen level, those neurons are gonna die. So it kind of doesn't matter. Um, No, so, so that's what I was talking about was blood flow going, coming around, not neural networks. Blood flow coming around from one vascular territory to another to supply the neurons. Yep. I'm curious about the mechanics between the areas you work on and the areas that Dr. Snyder works on. And I mean, basically you told us uh, you use liquid plumber or rotor rooter. <laughs> <laughs> And it, and it seems like David does about the same thing, but it's really, um, we hear more cholesterol uh, causing occlusions, I guess, in, in, in the heart area. It, it, tell me, if you could, just a little bit of the differences between what you see and versus what he sees. Sure, um, and, and cholesterol, um, high blood pressure and cholesterol and smoking are probably the three top um, risk factors for vascular disease and the vessels can be in the heart they can be the vessels that feed the heart or they can be in the brain or they could be anywhere really but where they seem to have the biggest impact is in the heart and the brain i'm sorry in the brain and the heart because i mean the the, the brain you know <laughs> um, so cholesterol contributes toward building plaque in those arteries um, and the one thing that we didn't really talk about, and I'm glad that you brought this up, is if you have something called atrial fibrillation or an irregular mm -hmm. heart rate, irregular heart beat, which many of us have, what happens is when the heart doesn't beat in a regular fashion and it's irregular, it tends to collect blood near the valves. Kind of like an eddy when you're canoeing down the river those rocks and those outcroppings, the water collects in there. And when, and when the blood collects near the valve, because it's not being regularly pushed through the heart, it clots. It develops clot. And when that clot sticks to the valve, eventually it can break off. And when the, the, when the clot breaks off from a valve in the heart, the risk is that it goes to the brain. And that's one of the ways that, that they are interconnected. So when somebody develops atrial fibrillation as an underlying disease, we talk about putting them on a blood thinner to prevent those clots from forming. The blood thinners have risks. Somebody on a blood thinner who falls and hits their head could end up having a traumatic head bleed. So it's, it's a risk benefit. But to come back, you know, the, the cholesterol, the high blood pressure, and, um, and, and uh, all, all these things affect the arteries, both in the heart and the brain. But is a baby aspirin, for instance, good for Dr. Snyder's patient, but ne may cause problems with your patient? No, no, no as a matter of fact, we, we do recommend 
that people are both on an aspirin and a statin. A statin is a cholesterol-lowering agent that has been shown to decrease the risk of stroke. And I would add to that that TPA is also a link. So tissue plasminogen activator was actually first used for myocardial infarction. And then the neurologists kind of were a little delayed in getting on board with it, and <laughs> then they finally did. But Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, but the heart doesn't bleed like the brain does. And so it's not just, you can't just, the protocols you use for myocardial infarction, you can't just use for the brain. So that, there had to be separate protocols, separate clinical trials to work out the TPA for the brain. But you're right, it's very similar, heart, myocardial infarction versus brain, but because they're such different organs, you can't do exactly the same thing. There's a mic. Did I understand you to say that if I'm with someone I suspect that's having a stroke, um, that is for me to call 911, get them to the hospital as soon as possible, because there's very little I can do from the first aid point of view that would help them at that particular time, other than to make sure they're safe. Absolutely, you 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 got it right on the right on the money. Um, the 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 most effective thing you can do is to call 911. And when you tell the dispatcher what's going on, they will, they will ask you other questions. They'll say, how old is the patient? Does he or she take any medications? And when was their last seen normal time? And you'll have some of that information for when EMS gets there. Um, genetically, does um, a PFO uh, increase the risk of stroke as we age, and if it does, does having surgery help? So and can you describe what a PFO yes. is, please? Yes, a PFO is a patent foramen ovale. When, when we're born, you got that? O-V-A. <laughs> let's, let's make it simple. When we're born, there is, um, there's an opening between the atria. Your heart has four chambers, two atria, two ventricles. And that opening in between the atria typically closes. But in a good percentage of us, it doesn't close. So some of the blood is going from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart by the atria. Why is that important? Well, that's important because there's many places in our bodies that we form clot. And one of the common places that we form clot is in the leg. So that's why if you're on a long car trip or a long plane trip, we tell you to get up and walk around and get your muscles moving. Because when your muscles work in your legs, they're actually producing TPA that's circulating and breaking down these little microclots that we're all forming. So let's come back. Let's say you develop a clot in the leg and you don't know about it and it breaks off and it comes up to the right side of the heart because that's where all the blood from your legs comes back to the right side of the heart. If it gets through that patent foramen ovale in somebody who it's still open, now it's on the left side of the heart and when it escapes the left side of the heart, it goes to the brain. So yes, that can increase that risk. If the clot is formed in your leg and you don't have a patent foramen ovale that's closed off, then it's going to go to the lungs and form a different type of problem. Okay? So in your question being, if I have a PFO, if I have a patent foramen ovale, if I close it off, does that decrease my risk for stroke? Yes, it does. But closing that off is a surgical procedure or it's an endovascular procedure and that has its, its own attendant risks with it. So we always have to look at it. Should I get this procedure or not? Some, in some cases, it's worth getting that procedure. In other cases, it's safer to just take a medication to thin your blood and not have clots. Hi. Um, thank you. You touched on um, lifestyle causes for blood clots and um, people with heart arrhythmias, I and mean, you just talked about people sitting for long periods. Can you talk about other reasons that people that are otherwise healthy might have a blood clot that might go to the brain? So um, 
And, and when you ask that question, I think of young people. Mm. Yes. We, we all think, oh, as we age, as we get older, we have in more risk for stroke, high blood pressure over time, cholesterol over time. We're all building cholesterol. Um, and, and, so that, and then we think the corollary is, oh, this person's young. They can't be having a stroke. Not true. And we talked about the dissection, the vertebral artery dissection. Now, I've taken care of some patients, some young patients with vertebral artery dissection. And if you have an underlying tissue, tissue disorder like Ehlers-Danlos or something like that that makes your tissue a little bit more friable, that is a risk factor. But in some of these people that we've seen, we ask them, what why did you have, what have you been up to, <laughs> right? And here's some of the answers. Now, I'm not saying that this is always the case, but in one, one woman that I took care of, she had been on a roller coaster a few days earlier, and she did one of these, right? And another person was doing CrossFit. Do you guys know what CrossFit is? Don't worry about it, okay? <laughs> Let me just say, CrossFit is this intense exercise where people get together in groups and they do like 200 squats in five minutes or something like that. I, I, it makes me tired thinking about it. But, but all that stress you know, can, can, can be a stress. Um, some people say that chiropractic manipulation can cause dissection. And, and remember the picture I showed you where the vertebral artery snakes through the uh, the vertebral bones. If you think about somebody, if they manipulate you really fast, you might just, you know, oh, you might just, you know, do something to that artery. I'm not saying that that we know that for sure, but some of that kind of trauma is implicated. Underlying um, blood disorders, uh, clotting disorders. Somebody can have a, something called a Factor V Leiden clotting disorder, and that can cause stroke. So when somebody comes in with a stroke, we're doing a full workup. We're getting an echocardiogram to see if they have any kind of clot on their valve. We're doing a full blood work workup to see if they have any of these blood clotting disorders. And we're asking a bunch of questions. Well, you know, what have you been up to? What, what's, what's going on? So the person who may have had an injury on a roller coaster or in CrossFit or at a chiropractor's office, would have suffered an injury that caused a clot? An injury that could have caused yeah. a dissection. Or a clot. Yeah. Or a clot, yeah. Yeah. No, they, yeah. Yep. yeah. I mean, because the dissection, as she said, causes a clot as well. So, yeah, yeah both. Thank you. Absolutely. There's some in the front, too. I don't know if we have mics. That... Now, please don't go to the CrossFit people and tell them <laughs> that I'm, you know. OK. I mean, get, yeah. <laughs> Can I ask? Well, I. I have two questions. One is, if you've had one stroke, are you at greater risk for having a second stroke? Uh, great and question. secondly, I'd like to know, when you have a stroke, should you have an MRI or a CAT scan or both? My sister, after a stroke, was told she should have had an MRI. Okay. okay. I'll take the first yeah. one, you take the second you take one. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, if you have a stroke, you are about a tenfold increased risk of having a second stroke. Probably because all the risk factors are there, you've already had it, but yes. And then you can take the imaging so, question. <laughs> so the question of CAT scan versus MRI is a little complicated. The first thing we do is we get a CAT scan. It's a plain, non-contrast CAT scan, and all we want to see is, is there blood or not? Because if it's an ischemic stroke with a clot, we're going down the TPA, endovascular pathway. If it's a hemorrhagic stroke or a bleed, we're doing none of that stuff. We're lowering blood pressure. We're reversing any kind of Coumadin or you know, uh, Eliquis or any of the medications that people take for blood thinners. We're going to reverse that right away. That's what we do with the bleeding strokes. So, if the, when we get to the MRI, that's when we we look at the CT and it doesn't really show us anything. So you could have a clot that's not going to show up in the first six hours on on the CT or the first twelve hours. And now we want to know. It, it, has that stroke happened? So remember when Marilyn showed the core and the penumbra, right? Early on, the MRI will be able to see the core and the penumbra. CAT scan doesn't see that. 
later, a day later, you're going to see stroke on the CAT scan. But now it's too late. The MRI can show you that early on. But the only time we're really asking that question is if you're beyond six hours and we're thinking about, should we do endovascular therapy? So that's, that's the question. That's when we bring out the MRI. And if there's a, a CT called CT perfusion that can do the same thing as that MRI. So uh, th the short answer is no. The first thing is the CT. That's what you need. And then you make your decision on TPA. And, and with timing, you make your decision on endovascular. I don't know if that helps, but. Um, yeah, it is. It is more complicated than you would think. But it sounds like if it's beyond six hours, and then you, you should probably get an MRI. No, no, no. If it's if it's if it's closer than six hours, and you're trying to make a decision, should we go in and do endovascular therapy? That's when an MRI might be helpful. Yeah. Early on. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Does temporal arteritis, that if a person has that, um, or has an episode, I don't know if episode is the right way to describe it, um, loss of vision in one eye, does that, in, as, a, as a consequence, um, does that inflammation, and, and if it's giant cell, does that increase the risk of stroke? I don't know, because that's in the, it's the blood vessels to the eye. Right, you can you can have clots in the eye. The inflammation would probably make it more prone to clotting because the endothelium becomes activated and that kind of thing. It's possible, but not large vessel occlusion so much. We're talking about locally within the eye, I think. Yep. Um, I have two questions. One was prompted by the person that mentioned baby aspirin, and about. I don't know, 20 years ago I heard of a friend's father who had um, a stroke and a f somebody, a passerby, happened to have baby aspirin on them and they stuck it under his tongue while they were waiting for the ambulance to come and um, later were told that that was a good move to do that. Mm -hmm. So that's my first question. And my second is, um, if fatty deposits are the cause of 85% of all clots, then how can we learn how clogged up we are? And I'm thinking of <laughs> those mailers that come that say for $145 or $175 you can come to someplace in South Burlington and they check you out for yep. knowledge and yep. you know, prevention sure. of, well, of to know yes. how liable yes. you, you are to have a stroke. What the was the first one? one? The baby, baby aspirin? aspirin? I'm gonna talk about the baby aspirin, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think that's probably not a good idea um, because if it was a hemorrhagic stroke, then you're just, or a hemorrhage, then you're just increasing the propensity for bleeding. I think you wanna find out first what kind of stroke it is. They got lucky, I would say, right? Absolutely, because before we get that CAT scan, we don't know if the stroke is caused by a clot or a bleed, and aspirin will further the bleed. So the second question, and I'm so glad you brought this up because I, I, I have strong feelings about it, and I'm sure that we all have strong feelings about it. These places where you can go and just get, you know, CAT scan everything and MRI everything, and I've seen people come into the, to the hospital with it and they have this list that says, we looked at every single organ, and you are at risk for this and this and this and this, and it freaks people out. Well, it's, this is, this is so not specific because if you, it, it, it's as much as saying you have a heart, <laughs> therefore you are at risk of having a heart attack. Right. It's, it's, ju it, it's just that broad. <laughs> no, it, what happens is you have to look at, when we use testing, there's an acronym that's out there in the medical world and we call, it's called VOMIT. V-O-M-I-T stands for Victim of Modern Imaging Technology. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is very, very true because if you get, for instance, remember we talked about 2% of us in this room have an aneurysm in our brain. 
Okay, so if we got a CTA on everybody in this room, we're gonna find who has aneurysms. Now how does that help you? That's gonna make you anxious and nervous to go to sleep at night, and it's gonna make you think every time you get a headache that you're gonna have an aneurysm rupture, and it's not gonna be helpful at all because 1% of those aneurysms will ever rupture, and you're better off just controlling your blood pressure and eating healthy and not smoking, et cetera. When you find things, now you feel compelled to do something about them. And every procedure and every surgery and everything we do has risk. So we balance the risk of the procedure against the risk of the disease that we're talking about. So um, it is entirely, entirely a disservice to the public to offer these, you know, uh, uh, test everything and, and we'll tell you what you're at risk for because it sends them down the pathway of, of more testing and more procedures um, and it's just not a good idea. Uh, am I? on getting an imaging test to prove that you have atherosclerosis, treat it. Control your blood pressure, have good cholesterol, eat right, exercise, keep your weight under control, see your primary care doctor. And then if you have extra money that you want to throw away, I'd love to go out to dinner, so just <laughs> throw it away. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. I'm trying to separate fact fiction from anecdotes. And I believe, or at least I read, that we're born with more neurons than we eventually get. They slough off, probably from not being used. Oh. And then you said that neurons die through a, because of a stroke. And uh, I'm questioning rehab. I saw once a documentary on TV a few years ago where this gentleman had a stroke, and through extensive rehab, physical therapy, two years later he was able to regain yeah. use of that arm. And was that because of the creation of new neurons? Or was this just a yeah. great anecdote? question? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. You know, years ago, even just ten years ago, we thought the number of neurons in the brain was fixed. It's not true. We actually do make neurons, um, and in certain brain regions, certain areas of the brain, there is neurogenesis that occurs. We know that. Um, so yes, there is hope for that. Um, and in terms of um, stroke rehabilitation. So when I talk about the core being dead, um, it fills in with other cell types. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't have neurogenesis. In fact, neurogenesis does occur with injury because of there's a repair process that goes on, okay? So that's a, it's a great question. Um, that rehabilitation can form neural networks that are very helpful. You may not be able to restore exactly that neural network that lifted your arm, but you can compensate for that. Um, there are trials. Um, a colleague of mine, a neurosurgeon, has done trials that are remarkable um, where he has injected stem cells. In, these are stroke patients that are years out from their stroke. They're not going, stroke evolves over the course of, of months, let's say. Um, in terms of, of uh, the repair and the rehabilitation of it. But you reach a point where there's no more repair that's going to happen, that that arm is not going to lift any more than it has for a time. He's injected stem cells into the core region, and sure enough, you know, he has videos of his woman now lifting her arm, right? Um, it may not be the stem cells. It might just be actually the movement of putting a catheter into the brain that stimulates growth factors to cause some neurogenesis and some repair. So, I mean, there is some hope. Um, we need a lot more studies before we start puncturing people's brains with needles and stuff. So, um, so there is hope for neurogenesis. There is hope for repair. And I think we're in a really good, um, good place now where, where, you know, this is where imaging actually really does help. And I'm not talking about clinical imaging, I'm talking about cellular imaging, um, where we can see things now that we've never been able to see before. 
Um, and yeah, it, I think we're, there's a lot of hope in the future for, for rehabilitation and repair Thank for you. those neurons. Yeah, great Thank question. Um, the, the question is, what is the Watchman device? Uh, yeah, the Watchman device. Um, do you want to answer that? So um, if you have the atrial fibrillation, that upper chamber doesn't contract normally, and when blood sits in the chamber, it can form clots, as you said already. Um, one way to treat that is to give your blood thinner. Um, some people can't take blood thinners because they have bleeding problems. So what they've learned is the majority of those clots actually form in the appendage, which is kind of exactly what you think. It's a little thing that sticks off the side of the atrium. And what, the, what we've learned is that you can occlude that appendage and get roughly the same <coughs> effectiveness as if you were taking a blood thinner. It's not the first line therapy, but it is, is an effective strategy for people who can't take blood thinners. <coughs> Does that make sense? I don't know. Do you want to give it back to <coughs> It's on. It's on? You mentioned um, how a young person could have a dissection, uh, the um, vertebrate um, clot, and it causes a sudden dizziness. Um, but aren't there many other things that could cause sudden dizziness? I mean, if you're a young, healthy person or not so young, healthy person and suddenly you're dizzy, what, what's the chances of that being a stroke versus any number of other things? So that's a very good question. Yes, there are many things that can cause dizziness. Sometimes, uh, and one of the more, more common things is benign positional peripheral vertigo. Um, you can have dehydration. You can have multiple different things. Um, when a young person comes in, or any person comes in with a sudden onset of dizziness, one of the hallmarks is that dizziness doesn't stop, it persists. And if you had dizziness because of, let's say, benign positional peripheral vertigo, we can do something to help. What that's caused by is a little stone in your, in your canal. And we can do a maneuver to help get that stone from being stuck in there and get you better. And the symptoms go away, and we say, oh, if the symptoms went away, then it's probably not because of a stroke, because you can't just make a stroke go away like that. And so what we'll do is we'll, we'll bring you in, and we'll look at the whole story, right? We'll look at your risk factors. We'll look at your how did this start, when did it start, what are the symptoms, and we'll do a neuro exam a full neuro exam. And that includes everything from, can you squeeze my hands, give me a smile, et cetera, to um, can you touch finger to nose? Can you touch heel to shin? Can you stand up and do a tandem gait? All right, now I don't need to know who's done a tandem gait in this audience, <laughs> right? but, but that's part of our neuro exam. If you can't walk straight, we're thinking something, something's wrong. And we gather enough evidence through our exam and our, our history, and we say, we think this might be a stroke, so we get an image. We get a CT and a CT with uh, contrast to look at the vessels, and that helps us. But you're right, most of the time, it is gonna be something more common. Our presenters are gonna take two more questions. Um, one of our guests up there, and then our final um, question will be asked by someone back here. Our presenters have agreed to stay just a little bit after the presentation, so you can walk up and ask them questions after. Two quick questions. Um, the first one you've touched on, I think, uh, indirectly several times. You mentioned always call 911, that 50% aren't strokes. I'm wondering what makes up that other 50%. Uh, again, you've touched on some of that briefly. And then unrelated, my second question, are there any risk or side effects to the sanguinate, if I've said that correctly? Oh. Um, the stroke, the first question is what are stroke mimics? What else can look like a stroke? Low blood sugar, low sodium, dehydration, seizures. Um, those are some of the common ones. Um, 
and, and, and many, of, many of those can be happening. And we can rule those out with, with other ways. So yes, come on in. <laughs> so the, the, the sanguinate is actually a blood product. It's a hemoglobin-based oxygen carrier. So you can't be allergic to bovine, okay? Um, probably the greatest risk is the volume that you have to inject. And so hypervolemia is a, is, most stroke patients can handle that, but some won't be able to. So if they have kidney issues, um, then they would be excluded. But um, it's a pretty, pretty safe um, comment. They're, they, it's past uh, phase one clinical trials for safety. So um, we're trying to get an efficacy trial going, actually. Yep, great question. Hi, my question is um, your current state of health in your brain and if you have been overweight and you've had high blood pressure and high cholesterol over time, but you change your diet, mm -hmm. um, is there any way of ascertaining exactly how much at risk you might be for a stroke? And if you change your diet and say you go five years, do you have less of a chance of stroke? Um, is there any imaging technology out there or on the horizon that would tell you that? you know, as opposed to a, a guess, as opposed to scientific? And I'm just curious what the state of the art is in that. So the, the answer to your first question is absolutely. If you change your diet, stop smoking, uh, uh, use, use you know, medication for blood pressure and, uh, you know, for cholesterol, you absolutely decrease your risk of stroke. Um, how much? We don't really know. Now, we, we've got studies that look at people who take statins versus people who don't. And over time, you know, we, longitudinal studies that look at people and we can make a guess. But the problem with studies is that you're, you're saying, well, there's a 75% a chance that this could happen. Well, how do I know if you're in the 75% or in the 25%? I really don't. And, and the best thing that you can do is, is just what you said, is, is decrease your risk by um, doing all those things to, to keep your health. And, and what Dr. Schneider said, all the things that take care of your cardiac health also take care of your stroke health. Um, it, they go hand in hand because we're talking about the vascular system, the, the arteries. Well, thank you very much. We've thank really enjoyed you. it.